sometimes I feel like I sound a bit like Jiminy Glick when I'm hosting this show. Oh, like, God. Uh, so much <laughs> love for Jiminy Glick. Jiminy Glick. Uh, <laughs> what? If you... Ebony, what's your freak out? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode 55. Anita's on an away mission this week, so it's me, Carolyn Pettit, in the captain's chair, and I'm joined, as always, by my fellow Copacabana enforcer, Ebony Adams. Hey, Ebony. Hey, Carol. I was trying to decide if we work at the Copacabana on weekends to earn a little extra cash, um, or if I wanted to keep going with the Star Trek metaphor and say that we uh, we go to the holodeck uh, in our spare time to live out our fantasy of being cool Copacabana of enforcers. Options. I couldn't decide, so I'll let the audience, um, you know, the listeners be the judge of that. Uh, given what we're going to be talking about today, I'm, I'm happy to be uh, working the Copacabana coat room with you. But we'll put it up to a Twitter poll, you know, okay. you, like, you know, when I was a kid, uh, sometimes like the A-Team or Night Rider or whatever would end with like, call, you know, this number if you want ending A or if you want ending B, like maybe we let listeners. Yo, can you imagine if we did a feminist frequency radio that was a choose your own adventure? Wow. I would yeah. love for us to do like some sort of radio drama. Yeah. Choose your own adventure thing. I mean, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm into it. All right, this is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we are the feminist killjoys coming for your medias, depending on your perspective. This week, we're going on a road trip with Viggo Mortensen and Mahershala Ali with a new film, Green Book. And after that, we'll finish the show by each sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out? Now, on with the show. God, I feel like... Sometimes I feel like I sound a bit like Jiminy Glick when I'm hosting this show. Oh, like, God. Uh, <laughs> so much love for Jiminy Glick. Jiminy Glick. Uh, <laughs> what? If you, Ebony, what's your freak out? <laughs> if you do not know who Jiminy Glick is, please do yourself a favor and Google Jiminy Glick interviews Steven Spielberg and you will Oh you will my shit God, yourself. Some of these interviews are just, <laughs> just tremendous. Uh, <laughs> um... So, you know, first things first, before we actually get into the show uh, proper this week, I need to actually issue an apology for something I said on last week's show. Um, for those of you who listened to last week's show will recall we uh, uh, the, the main topic was the chilling adventures of Sabrina. And during our discussion of the show, we talked for a bit about the character of, uh, of Susie, um, one of, you know, Sabrina's uh, high school friends. And during the conversation about Susie, uh, uh, we, we spoke a bit about Susie's uh, sort of gender identity, uh, which, which is, um, I think, sort of undefined by the show at this point, or maybe by the character of Susie themselves. They, they seem to be in a point of maybe potentially exploring it. Um, uh, apparently in one episode that maybe is later in the season that I didn't see, Susie maybe steals a copy of uh, Orlando, the, the novel by Virginia Woolf, um, which is definitely a clear indication, you know, or a way for the show to kind of nod about the, the gender uh, explorations that the character of Susie might be kind of kind of going through. And um, and at one point during the conversation, um, I uh, made a distinction that I should not have made, a distinction that was incorrect, uh, during which I, I said um, that Susie, um, you know, might be uh, non-binary, but is not trans. And so what I did there was I created a sort of opposition between non-binary and trans, which, which uh, um, I... I Obviously, non non binary identities can be and are trans. Non binary people can be and are trans people. So that was uh, not something I, I I should have said, and I sincerely apologize. Um, part of what I mean, not not by way of excuse at all, but just to kind of um, review the the conversation a bit. I I got confused and thrown off at one point during the conversation because. I understood or maybe misunderstood Anita to be suggesting that Susie was a trans woman. That is that Susie identified as a woman, but had transitioned, you know, maybe was not assigned female at birth, it, but had transitioned and was, you know, uh, and was so as a young trans woman. And, you know, which I did not see to be the case. And so I, I was sort of trying to push back against that. But in doing so, I... I, I I misspoke and I got you know my wires my wires crossed and I I sincerely apologize for 
for the error that I that I made. Of course, non-binary people can be and are trans people. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. And no, again, no excuses. I think part of our confusion, because it did stem from confusion, is that neither you nor I had have seen the entire season, um, first season of Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. And <laughs> I, I doubt either one of us is going to. Um, but I think, you know, at least from the five or six episodes I saw, the show itself is not clear. And I think this is one area you want to be clearer um, about what you're expressing. So again, not a, not an excuse or a rationalization, but yeah. Yes, uh, you're right. You're right. Uh, I, um, I, I mean, I think it's a very valid and interesting uh, character arc that they may be setting up, right? It's entirely possible that Susie, because apparently later in the season, a character uses male pronouns when referring to Susie and Susie does not uh, object to it. So uh, it it may be that, you know, it's pure speculation. It may be that Susie will uh, come to identify explicitly as non-binary. It may be that Susie will, um, will, uh, is a, is a man, is a trans man. We, you know, we don't know. Um, there's obviously a lot of possibilities, a lot of places that can go. Um, yes. Um, anyway, so I, I'll be very interested to see where, where that show goes with that in, in the future. Um, all right, Ebony, what do you got for us in entertainment news this week? The tables have turned. Yeah, and people will recall that any time the tables have been turned in the past and I've gotten to deliver uh, pop culture news, it is terrible. Um, usually the news is bad, but also I <laughs> I rarely consider what other people might uh, want to hear about or might want to discuss. This is all about things that I give a shit about. So um, here we go. Uh, number one. Daredevil has been canceled after three seasons on Netflix. Uh, so it has joined Iron Fist and Luke Cage in cancellation. It's very interesting to me that of the Marvel slate um, that I assumed, um, because, you know, I exist only in my own tiny corner of the internet, that, you know, I, I assume the entire Marvel slate was was doing well. I constantly see people talking about it, tweeting about the, show, the shows, et cetera. Um, but yeah, three of the five... Uh, have been canceled. We can now assume then that there'll be no resumption of interest in the Defenders um, mashup series either. So what we have left is Jessica Jones yeah, um, and Punisher. And I find it very oh, interesting. Oh, God, Punisher. I totally yeah. forgot about Punisher. Every, well, <laughs> I think a lot of people did. But, um, but I find it interesting that, so you had five shows, right? So you had Jessica Jones, Punisher, uh, Iron Fist, Luke Cage, and Daredevil. Um, Luke Cage, obviously, lead actor, black man. Um, uh, Daredevil, lead actor, white, disabled lead actor. Um, you know, Iron Fist uh, has yeah. a, obviously a, a white male lead, but but my understanding, because that show looked terrible, was that Misty Knight and Colleen Wing, black woman and an Asian woman, respectively, um, were, were vital parts of that cast, right? So I think it's very interesting that of the two shows that are remaining, they're both fairly straightforward in terms of their casting of straight white people, right? Um, but I think also, you know, there's a, there's a business aspect to this and that Disney, which owns these characters, is gearing up for a new streaming service of their own called Disney Plus. And the word is that they are going to be pulling uh, Marvel movies to that. They will only be available on that Disney streaming service. So movies like, you know, The Avengers or Black Panther or whatever, any upcoming things. Um, so I'm wondering how much of these recent cancellations has to do partially with that business decision. But I, I can't help but suspect that a lot of it is just that there is you know, currently at, at whatever level, whether it's purely at the level of the audience or purely at the level of the decision makers, you know, um, really an inability to let some of these grow further and, and gain an audience if they don't have a white, straight, you know, able-bodied um, or abled, I should say, a lead character. I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. And I thought of all of them, I actually had thought that Daredevil uh, was the most popular um, after Jessica Jones. Uh, which may obviously still be the case, but it, it didn't, you know, reach whatever bar um, needed to be so that they could go into season four. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see if, if, you know, in, as Jessica Jones continues, presumably we'll get at least one more season of Jessica Jones. If, you know, characters like Luke Cage or, you know, maybe uh, some of the other characters whose shows have been canceled will continue to 
to sort of weave in and out and play supporting roles in that narrative as these shows have had so many kind of little crossovers and things before, or if with their shows being canceled, they will largely be kind of, you know, written out of, of say Jessica Jones as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you watch any of the uh, Marvel shows on Netflix? Uh, Only Jessica Jones. Yeah, I I watched Jessica Jones and enjoyed it. Um, I I really loved Daredevil. I think I spoke in an earlier episode about how I just finished watching season three. I loved uh, Luke Cage. Iron Fist was never going to watch. I started watching Punisher and and binged through like, I don't know, I want to say three episodes. But it is it is hard going for reasons it might be useful or interesting to unpack uh, in a later episode. Because I do think this show was... Trying occasionally to comment upon like hyper violence and hyper masculinity, but in a way that was so easily dismissible by a huge portion of its audience that you have really sort of like, um, you know, many reactionary toxic parts of its fandom you know, essentially saying like, yes, this show speaks to us. This is like, they absolutely embrace the vigilanteism that the Punisher, you know, engages in with no sense that there might be a critique underlying it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. 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 What else you got for us? Oh, boy. Okay. So this is not pop culture news. This is simply culture news. And it's I give up news. Uh, Former President George H.W. Bush died a few days ago. And It amazes me whenever a historical figure like this dies, the way that people who are supposedly liberal or progressive outdo themselves to be seen as civil and politic by offering encomiums about people. Listen, George H. W. Bush, war criminal. Okay. I I mean, 100%. You know, unmitigated. Yes. And like that should be the dominant, like, narrative about. You know, his legacy yeah. his you know, passing. And yet, is that what we're getting from the media? No. No, I don't care about his service dog. I don't care I know. about his family relationships. I don't care what his lap blankets look like. Yeah. You know, somebody like- tell his dog what a what a monster his master was. So he doesn't like curl up sadly by the coffin anymore, man. I, that like, man was you know not what? worth you the love. You don't get dedication. to humanize a person like this who spent his entire life dehumanizing others and actively campaigning for the death and suppression of others. I mean, if you want to talk about one issue, it was recently at World's AIDS Day. If you want to talk about the devastation wreaked upon the LGBT community um, via, you know, people like Reagan and Bush, and then, you know, expect me to to not give you my full-throated opinion of that person after they pass simply because they have done what every human being will always do, which is ultimately die. No. And you know what else? <laughs> this whole notion that, like, don't speak ill of the dead, y'all can fuck right off with that. But also, like, if you feel as if you are unwilling for whatever personal reasons to speak ill of the dead... You can always choose to not say anything. You don't have to join in the chorus of people who are trying to humanize a monstrous figure like this. You can just say nothing. But that's clearly never, ever going to be the case. And so you get figures like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, you know, uh, talking to us about what a devoted family man he was and how he was a true statesman, which blew my fucking mind. Uh, So... I guess this is me campaigning for people to just say nothing. Yeah, I think people, sometimes people who don't really understand what's at stake here will 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 look at um, uh, at people sort of raising the reality of of who uh, uh, a man like George H. W. Bush was and say, "Oh, you're just like you're just doing it to like dance on his grave. It's just about like glee at his death, and it's really not about that at all. Fundamentally, it's about trying to challenge." What we know is almost certainly going to be the dominant historical narrative of, oh, he was a great statesman. He was a good, decent family man. He was a good president, et cetera. And like inject the truth in there of, of no, actually what we should be focusing on is, you know, the, 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 all the, the people of, uh, Iraq who needlessly died because of his, uh, his malicious actions, the people, the, the, the gay people who, who needlessly died because of the, his negligence, you know, as president during, you know, uh, the height of the AIDS crisis, et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, these things 
uh, uh, will be erased by history if people don't, um, you know, uh, refuse to be to be silent about about them. Absolutely. So, um, fine. Do I have time for one final piece of uh... squeeze in one last quick uh, story for us? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is something that I've been very interested in. There's been this. Um, uh, this discussion lately, a, a more prevalent discussion lately about <laughs> depending upon what Twitter circles you, you float around in is ultimately called either black fishing or nigger fishing. So this is the phenomenon whereby people who are white, um, have been sort of donning, accessorizing with, you know, the cultural markers of a certain kind of blackness, specifically on Instagram, other forms of social media, but specifically Instagram. So I'm speaking specifically about people like um, white Swedish um, Instagram star Emma Hallberg, right, who is a, a white girl, um, who has, you know, very fair skin uh, in her earlier pictures and, you know, sort of straight but fairly nondescript brunette hair. But then, you know, as she becomes more famous or in fact becomes famous for darkening her skin, not blackface, but, you know, heavily tanned um, and then, you know, big gold earrings, um, the sort of like urban fashion that is, you know, most associated with a black woman. And this is rife on Instagram. And it is it, 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 these are the the sorts of you know influencers in quotation marks right who are often celebrated because of their presumed proximity to blackness while not being black if in fact they ever make it explicit that they are not black right there is only one form of blackness that they are interested in right and it's a very codified marketplace um kind of blackness um but the whole point is they are they have entered a marketplace in which you know race and culture can be traded for esteem and for dollars um because it has the trappings of a certain kind of blackness but is not in fact black itself so it is very um it, it's very safe to consume i think it's very interesting that it's primarily young women uh who are engaging in this um i think it's very interesting you know so it's not just youth but but that it's women right we we rarely see um men doing this um to any large extent but i'm i'm just i'm blown away by this so you can check this out you can look check out the hashtag um there's an article on slate um about it we'll put the link up there but yeah. I don't spend yeah, a lot of people. time on Instagram, but even I recognize, and I have seen these pictures of people who I assumed were, you know, uh, biracial or who were very light complexion black women. Um, but it turns out they are white. And when you ask them, what is it about, you know, like, what are you trying to do? Um, what is this? Uh, their, their answers are, are really slippery. Um, and they will, you know, swear up and down that they are not accessorizing with blackness. And yet, and still, it's clear that that's exactly what they're doing. And audiences are eating it up. I mean, we're talking about people who have hundreds of thousands, if not more, of followers who absolutely love what they're doing. But as I say, it's about proximity to blackness. It's about, you know, a perceived distance to, from whiteness, but in a safe zone, a sort of liminal zone, um, whereby you get the cool factor, but you have none of the other associations um, or challenges associated with actually living with that racial identity. As the great Paul Mooney once said, everybody want to be a nigga, but nobody want to be a nigga. So that's it for... <laughs> Pop culture news from your pal Ebony. Did you know that we can keep bringing Feminist Frequency Radio to the airwaves because of you? It's true. If you're enjoying our show, please consider joining our podcast community at d.rip slash femfreak. You'll get access to some fun perks and bonus episodes. So that's d.rip slash femfreak. And uh, interestingly, that last pop culture news story, I think, serves as a as a pretty interesting lead in to our main topic of conversation today, which is the the new film Green Book, because in the film, uh, there are actually kind of explicit conversations, you could say, mm -hmm. about like what it means to be in a sense, you know, quote unquote, really black. Yeah. Right. Um, so Green Book is a new drama starring uh, Viggo Mortensen and Marshala Ali. I like that they that they were committed to getting two lead actors who both have names that are kind of difficult to pronounce. Um, this movie is directed by 
of all people, uh, Peter Farrelly, who, with his brother Bobby Farrelly, was responsible famously for films uh, including, you know, There's Something About Mary, Dumb and Dumber, Kingpin, those sort of really broad, <clears throat> uh, raunchy comedies. Uh, this film is um, it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a drama. It has sort of uh, Oscar bait kind of written all over it. Um, Green Book, the film, is set in the early 1960s, and the title of Green Book refers to a series of publications by a man named Victor Green. The publications were called The Negro Motorist Green Book. Uh, They were published from 1936 to 1966, and they were intended to provide Black people who were traveling in the United States with information about where they could stay, where they could eat, and so on, um, in you know, the, the hopes that they might minimize their risk of running into and encountering, um, well, certainly establishments where they were explicitly unwelcome or, and, of course, um, violence, though there, there's no uh, way to travel uh, throughout the United States, you know, as a black person then or, or now uh, without the risk of violence. But um, the books were, were intended as guides to, to, uh, to sort of minimize that or mitigate that. But the film, you know, despite being called Green Book, it isn't really about the Green Books at all. They're sort of just a minor prop in the story. The film is about, it is as the, as the posters tout, it is, quote, based on a true friendship, um, which, so the film is about <laughs> right, Italian yeah. tough guy, uh, Tony Vallelonga, which I'm probably saying wrong. And in fact, the movie makes some jokes about how his name is kind of tough to pronounce. Uh, he's, he's referred to, uh, widely as Tony Lip because he's, he was the best bullshitter in, uh, in Brooklyn or the Bronx or whatever among a circle of friends when he was a kid, Tony Lip. He takes a job driving the brilliant jazz pianist, Don Shirley, who is a black man. Uh, and his trio, the Don Shirley trio, um, you know, on a tour of the Deep South. Interestingly, the National Board of Review just named Green Book the best film of 2018 um, and named Viggo Mortensen best actor. So let me start by saying that, look, you know, if I had seen this is exactly the kind of film that if I'd seen it when I was, say, 15, you know, like a well-meaning young white kid who had no real media literacy, you know, awareness and certainly wasn't privy to conversations or about representation and, and so on. Like I would have thought this was like a good movie. I would have thought, Hey, you know, it's a good movie. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's clearly like anti-racism. It's, you know, whatever. It's a heartwarming story of like a, uh, you know, a white man and a black man who become friends, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and I really think that even today, um, the white critical sort of establishment would have largely like accepted and praised this film. It's only in my mind because, you know, thanks to social media and, you know, websites that, uh, and outlets where more writers of color, you know, have a voice and can raise issues about these things that, that really um, were able now to see a, a pushback against this film and, and see the important issues about, about it um, raised uh, because, you know, I think that it is such that so much the generic sort of Oscar prestige picture that seems exactly seems to uh, uh, I'd say most white viewers, not only, you know, innocuous, but even kind of pleasant and even kind of, positive in its message that that um that most sort of white people who aren't well versed in these conversations would be inclined to see it as like a you know a a a good film both sort of in terms of the filmmaking and in terms of like its its message and its its values yeah i think so for those of you who have not seen the film first I, i would not recommend this film to anyone except to say if you need something um fairly inoffensive um, that won't make you uncomfortable um, to watch with your family over the holidays, you could go see this um, and you can just sort of quietly seethe like I did, but, but that's, that is essentially what it is. And so the, um, the praise that has been heaped on this film by largely white critics blew my mind as I was sitting through it. I was prepared. I had read quite a bit about the film and about critical reactions to the film, both from, from white critics and from black critics before seeing it. 
Um, and I was determined to go in with an open mind. But as the minutes ticked by, and by the way, if you're counting, uh, this is definitely an Ebony runtime rundown. I was starting to check my watch at like hour 30 and I was just like, get me out of here. Um, but this is a film, as has been said, a film by white people for white people. And I think, you know, as you say, it is a way for, because it is a, you know, shiny example of the white savior trope in film, it is a way for white people to feel comfortable about doing nothing other than being friendly. There is this pernicious myth that systematic racism will be eradicated if we can all just get along as people. If you can just meet a gay person and see that they are human. If you can just share a beer with a Mexican person and see that they're human. If you can just talk over your fence at your neighbor who is a disabled woman, you will see that she is human. You know, this is, this is a myth that is, it, it, it blinds us. It is seductive, but it is ultimately false. Um, and so the film is super offensive in that way. But I also want to talk about how, again, you know, as you say, Carol, so the film is called Green Book, right? From the title alone, I was expecting Mahershala Ali to play a bigger role in the film that is ostensibly about his life and his experiences in the South. It is not about him. The film is about uh, his driver, Tony Villalonga. It is even, I would say, in until the first third of the movie has transpired, not even so much about their friendship. About It's about Tony and his family. Um, and, you know, oh, absolutely. So it, it, yeah. it, it's not even like the friendship that is supposed to form the, the backbone of this film doesn't even, you know, uh, take up as much part of the film as it should. But, you know, I remember thinking, you know, before, like, it takes forever for the green book, the titular green book of the title to actually make an appearance in the movie. And so I was thinking, like, why is this film called Green? It is not, you would, it is entirely possible to go into this film not knowing what a green book is and having very little more idea about what the Negro Motorist Green Book was at the end of this film. You certainly don't learn anything about sundown towns, which form oh. a, you know, a, a crucial segment of the film. But then it occurred to me, and this is by no means something that has just occurred to me. I'm not a genius here, but that Tony Lip is himself the green book of the film, right? Like that's why it's <laughs> like he has been cast as the, the, the thing that does what the actual green books did for black people, which is allow them to have safe passage through the highways and byways of America and ensure that they have, you know, fun and engaging experiences. You know, the Green Book is not the Negro Motorist Green Book, the paper example. Right. It is the person of Tony Villalaga. And it just, it blew my mind. Like the arrogance, the arrogance of suggesting that what black people need is just friendly white people. White people who encourage them to live some more authentic version of blackness that includes Kentucky Fried Chicken and Little Rich I was losing my shit in this movie. I wanted to burn down the theater. Yeah, I mean, so the danger, right, of films, because, and this is not like, it's not an individual film. Green Book, Green Book is emblematic of a pattern that runs throughout, you know, cinema history of films that center white people in stories about like racism and and in which so the the really yes uh, this is not a film in which the two characters have equal importance in the story. It is a film about uh, uh, Don Shirley, the character played by Marshall Ali, is there. His function in the arc of the narrative is to provoke the growth and change it, it, to whatever degree that happens in the Viggo Mortensen character. Um, you know, having said that, I do think that, um, that uh, I, I, I have to praise Marshall Ali's performance in this film. Like uh, he is extraordinary. I mean, what a range this actor has, you know, when I mean, when I thought he was phenomenal, you know, in Moonlight, but that was one type of character. And here we see him playing an entirely different man. And like, uh, and, and he inhabits the role so completely such that, I mean, the, the, the physicality of his performance, the precision and sort of delicacy, the controlled way he moves that speaks to, I think, and reveals the way that the character of Don Shirley has to, has to control 
his emotions so profoundly as he travels through a world and and you know and specific parts of america in particular that ex- that explicitly hate him i mean just the tremendous effort of will that that must require and that you know to 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 look in the face of that kind of dehumanization with I mean, you know, with any kind of dignity. And and then, you know, you have these moments, these scenes in which you actually see him on the piano, playing the piano. And, I mean, there is something about the, the way that he moves when he is playing the piano. It To me, it spoke to, like, um, like, perhaps it is only when he is there on stage at the keys of the piano that he experiences some measure of freedom in the sense that he can like express or channel his feelings into something because you see all this emotion uh, uh, in his body. You know, it's, um, it's a real, really remarkable performance, not to mention like, I mean, he looks amazing. I mean, there, you know, early, early on in the film, uh, he, you know, he's like wearing this like dark blue suit, I think, as he's like sitting in the back of the car on the road trip. And oh, my God, he looks like the just incredible, oh, you yeah. know, like he just looks amazing. He, th- um, there's so many stills um, from this film that look as if, <clears throat> excuse me, they came out of a GQ spread. Um, he, Mahershala is a canvas um the upon which like color and emotion finds free expression as the film progresses and and I agree with you his performance is absolutely marvelous and in fact both Viggo Mortensen and yes. Ali deserve a, a better film you know these are two exactly. phenomenal actors who deserve better writing at a better film and i think there is there is a film that could have been made about this that they could have started in that would have been absolutely remarkable to watch but one of the things that i do credit Ali with is that as the film progresses, you know, I, I, I take offense at the notion that he is allowed to live more authentically and more honestly the longer he travels with, with Tony. But I nevertheless responded to the way that yes, he physically starts to uncoil as the film goes on. And so the thing that we can't even imagine him doing at the beginning of the film, which is smiling or laughing, he does with such explosive joy later in the film. There is nothing in this world like a Mahershala Ali smile. The, it takes over his face. You just want to fall into it, you know? And the, the quiet moments, too. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Silent Green is people. So one of the things that you uh, probably do not know, if you've never heard of Don Shirley... You certainly wouldn't have heard about this. Um, and I don't, I haven't read too much, um, uh, like sort of casual conversation, um, about the film that, that talks about this. But it is also important that this is the story, not just of a black man, but a black queer man. And yes. so after, um, in a, in a very, you know, moving scene, after Tony has had to, you know, sort of rescue essentially, um, Don Shirley from the clutches of a, um, uh, a police force that has c- caught him, you know, in flagrante with a white man in a at a YMCA in the Deep South. After that, you know, the the relationship between them, at least as far as Don Shirley is concerned, now is fraught with anxiety and tension that he had n- never hoped to be there. This was something about him that you know was private. He had never hoped to reveal, right? Um, and he makes an assumption that Tony will take the opportunity to you know to leave him on the road and go off and you know conduct business with his mobster buddies. The way that he asks Tony to stay, that quiet moment where he is he is pleading. Um, without, you know, whining or begging, but it, you can, it is the smallest moment. Um, and he, he makes this request in the only way that he can know, he knows how, which is to offer Tony more money and a, you know, a title bump to, to road manager. Um, but just the, the way that he carries that grief of knowing, like, I, please, please. 
Yeah. It was it was just a phenomenal. It was <laughs> I wish there had been more of that in the film. Yeah. I wish that I believed so, you know, um cuz the Tony Tony character, uh, I mean, he's obviously he was a real person, but of course these are these are fictional constructs of those people to serve the the needs of a of a sort of conventional script. So, I can't know what the real Tony's attitudes or prejudices or beliefs would have been specifically at this time. But, you know, he is a man who explicitly has a lot of, I mean, he, you know, he, he constantly says that like all Germans are, I don't know, rats or something, you know, like he, 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 he openly to, to Don Shirley, like he expresses his attitudes of just generalizing entire groups of people. And yet then when, you know, this news, when he learns about um, that that Don Shirley is queer, he says, you know, hey, it's a complicated world. I've been working in New York nightclubs my whole life. Hey, like, I, I didn't entirely believe that he would be so sort of, you know, uh, uh, I mean, comfortable isn't the right word, but so sort of um, permissive, I guess, about that uh, while... Well, maintain it's like he's enlightened in this one particular area, but but still holding on to all these extremely backwards ideas in all these other areas. I I just didn't believe it in the in the in in the framework of the story, uh, uh, in the arc of his character, I guess, as the as the as the screenplay was presenting it. Yeah, and I mean, uh, even if 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 that were actually true, again, uh, your personal relationships, your personal individual relationships with individual people, does not exempt you um, from you know horrific racism or misogyny or homophobia as expressed you know against the entire community. So it takes Tony Lip you know, coming to work for this regal, dignified, almost astoundingly accomplished Black pianist for him to, you know, start to, you know, uh, take that mental journey to believe that, oh, you know, he's a he's a man like I am, you know, he deserves respect. Like, do but the amount of hoops that, you know, Black people, that people of color have to jump through, you, we have to be superhuman, to be considered human, right? You know? And yeah. there's the the notion that this is what it takes, that we need to perform dignity and respectability and genius um, for then individual people to decide to grant us their friendship and, you know, consequently their humanity is offensive to me. I'm also offended by the fact that, you know, um, at the end of the movie, we see, you know, that Tony and... And Don have made it back to New York just in time for Christmas Eve dinner. And uh, Tony's family is having this huge family gathering. Um, and these are people that we have, you know, seen be casually racist throughout the film about Black people, right? And yet <laughs> the film chooses to have Don Shirley, you know, have an epiphany that no, he does need human connection. And the people he needs human connection with is Tony and his family. So he, he goes, the film ends with him, you know, making the, the move outside of himself, you know, taking the chance to, to not be lonely, to connect with someone and going over to Tony's house. And we're supposed to celebrate this. And I'm like, no, why is it always us that has to do all of the work? Why? is it that he has to enter their world but it is never about them entering our world you know um yeah so yeah i mean this film to be clear it was it was so it was directed by peter Farrelly, who is of course a white man and he co-wrote it with uh uh brian hayes curry and with nick uh valalonga the uh, tony's real life son so the, all three writers on this are are white men, as well as the director being a white man. And and you know, like this is not a story that should have been entirely conceived and written and directed from a white perspective. Like that, that's just somewhere along the line in terms of the you know you have this idea for a film. Hey, we can tell a story about this, like this uh, road trip, this uh, friendship, whatever. You know, somewhere along the line, you say, okay, but we need to get some black involvement in this, right? Because this is not our story. This is not our story to tell entirely. And um, yeah, so that's a fundamental uh, problem with it, I think. Um, yeah. I do want to... Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, especially when um, 
the decision has been made that the story is going to be um, structured <laughs> in the way that it is. But if you were going to suggest, as the film does, that white people need to teach black people how to culturally code switch, which is precisely what this film teaches, <laughs> like Tony, you know, teaches Don Shirley how to navigate blackness in a way that makes absolutely no sense. And one of the, um, you know, critical reactions to this film that we should take note of is the reaction of Don Shirley's own family who, you know, have taken issue with the lies of this film, such that, you know, the film suggests that, for instance, that Don Shirley was sort of completely divorced from from blackness in the black community. There's a scene where Marshall Ali, you know, says, like, if I'm not black enough for black people, and if I'm not white enough for white people, you know, what am I? Um, th this is not true. Don Shirley was embraced by the black community. Um, and yet the film chooses to pull him out of blackness. As I've suggested, there's a way in which um, the white audiences and, you know, the white creators needed to shape his blackness. And to do so, they had to pull him out of extant um, blackness, you know, in a way that, it, it, that just, you know, obviously it shouldn't sit well with, with people. But yeah, I think that if there had been, you know, black people involved in, you know, the creation of this film, they, they, they would have been able to shape it in a way that didn't suggest that. Yeah, um, as... Um... As Candace Frederick, so Candace Frederick wrote a story for Slash Film uh, in, with the headline, Green Book somehow manages to make a uniquely black story all about the white guy and the results are ridiculous. Um, she, uh, in her piece, writes, you know, that, um, well, you know, one issue with the film, uh, quote, is the fact that Tony's voice is the more prominent one between the two, often sharing his bad takes on black music and food, since he's supposedly a better expert on blackness than Dr. Shirley, because he listens to Little Richard and eats fried chicken with his bare hands, and the latter does not. It's impossible to reconcile the terrible irony that this racist white man tries to enlighten a black man about his culture using silly stereotypes as he carelessly totes around the green book. This is utterly ridiculous. Um, I do want to say uh, briefly, though, uh, as you mentioned, like Viggo Mortensen is also, I think, you know, both of these actors play characters who very easily could have been the stuff of caricature. You know, it's certainly the, you know, Tony could have just been the, the, uh, the broad kind of, hey, mob, tough guy character. And obviously he has those elements, but I do think Viggo Mortensen just inhabits the role again to a degree that he makes Tony a little more than that, but also like the way his physicality contrasts with Shirley's physicality. So, so uh, Tony moves through the world, just taking up as much space as possible. Like he's just so huge in his physicality and just as if he feels entitled to exist and take up space uh, as much space as possible, which is what the world has kind of taught him is the case. But, and there was one moment in the film where, um, uh, Don Shirley says something. I forget what it was, but, uh, Tony has the, the, the rather the completely absurd reaction of, um, uh, that's a very prejudiced thing you just said to me. Um, this, you know, and it reminded me so much of Trump saying to a reporter who challenged him about, you know, something recently, Trump saying, that's a very racist question. Right. <laughs> um, it, that, that like for a moment I could actually see, I'm like, wow, you know, with this physicality and, and I think with his like range as an actor, um, Viggo Mortensen could offer like if there were a film that were trying to really lay bare Trump's ego and his kind of evil um, I, I think that that there's a way in which Viggo Mortensen you know he he may not be able to mimic Trump uh, you know accurately necessarily but he could provide such a psychologically believable portrayal and I saw you know a, a, just that flash before my eyes in that moment, I was like, oh my God, like I would uh, suddenly I like, I really want to see like a very serious film that's about laying bare Trump's uh, ego and, uh, you know, personality with like maybe Viggo Mortensen in that role because he's just so good at like taking up yeah. space so completely. Yeah. In fact, you know what? When we have our um, John Wick uh, podcast miniseries, mm -hmm. I would I would love it if we followed it up with a podcast miniseries on uh, Viggo Mortensen and history of violence and Eastern promises oh, because I yes. feel like those those the 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 four films speak to each other in a lot of ways. I would love yes. to do this. Let's do it. Let's record it today. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, great. I think we both have more to say about this film. So we're going to continue this conversation in the bonus. So uh, if you're a Feminist Frequency Radio backer, you can uh, listen to that. Uh, And now it's time for... What's your freak out? Ebony, what's your freak out this week? (laughs) My freak out is I can't be trusted with a streaming service or to make media decisions on my own, Caro. So every day, every day, we are presented with the gift of new, amazing things to watch, to play, to read, to engage with. But inevitably... I turn my back on these things and just rewatch old favorites, right? So my freak out this week is that something I do probably, I don't know, once or twice a year is rewatch a bunch of old West Wing episodes because I used to love that show. Sure. I used to love it. Um, and I, like a lot of people who, you know, watched it either when it was out or when it um, shortly after it ended, um, you know, fell into the trap of imagining that it was more liberal uh, than it actually is. Um, Yes. Right. So anyways, I've been rewatching the show and I have been just increasingly horrified by the way I fell for the Aaron Sorkin okie doke through all the years that I tried to convince other people to watch the West Wing. Um, and uh, one of the things that I have been increasingly confronted with is, and I wish there probably is a study on this. I bet if I looked for it, if I Googled it, it would be there. But if if not, can someone go back through all seven seasons of The West Wing and just count the number of times someone explicitly says, we're going to have a woman problem or we have a woman problem? Or we're going to have a problem with Blacks. Because this happens so often in the show. And it's presented as, you know what? Yeah, uh, you know, what these people are saying is valid, whether it's about like family medical leave, whether it's about racial profiling, you know, whatever. But they're preventing us from doing actual governing by bringing up these issues. Why won't these people just let us make these decisions and stop making problems for us? And it's so horrific and insidious because the the core group of people on the West Wing are people that we love. They they are smart. They are passionate. Um, They are on the side of the righteous, we are told. And so when a character that we love, a character like, you know, Josh Lyman, for instance, who is the deputy chief of staff, you know, when he expresses the opinion that, you know, we're trying to get this budget passed, but the National Organization for Women is throwing up trouble because, you know, they're they're not letting, you know, this amendment about uh, lack of family. This is going to hurt us. Why do they keep doing stuff like this? We are supposed to um, sympathize with his position and resent the women who are making his life difficult. <laughs> and this, this show does this constantly. And when it's not disrespecting women in this way, you will find I, this is another thing I want people to count. If you, Aaron Sorkin has never met a speech he would not write and have someone deliver, particularly his character stand-ins like Josh Lyman. But if you were to track how often someone needs the complexities of a particular legislative issue or constitutional uh, protocol explained, and the person delivering that explanation is a smug white man delivering it to a younger woman, a subordinate woman, or a person of color, I think we would be surprised by how often that happens on the show. Or perhaps not surprised at all. I have have gone from rewatching this show because I loved it so much to rewatching it just to point out in every single episode how fucked up it is. Um, yeah. So that's my freak out. Would love to yeah. talk about it with the people who I already know. I can think of the usernames who are going to be hitting me up on Twitter uh, to argue with me about this. But that's my freak out for the week that I was inexplicably rewatching The West Wing all weekend. <laughs> At this point, I think the only part of The West Wing that I still like to rewatch mm-hmm. is the, the 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 five minutes or whatever from the one season finale where the storm breaks and Dire Straits yeah. uh, Brothers in Arms starts playing mm-hmm. yeah. and, yeah. you know, and uh, 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 yeah. 
watch this. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so good. Uh, all right. So my freak out this week, I really only have one option of something to choose for my freak out this week because it's literally the only thing I've been doing in any or all of my spare time. Singing with your church choir? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have to talk about Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, I And I don't even know what I want to say about it because I'm still playing it. And this is a game that is full of contradictions. And it's a game that I love and I hate at the same time. And it has moments of beauty and surprisingly interesting character arcs and writing and things it's doing that are uh, that are that very much in my mind run against the grain of the typical kind of you know video game power fantasy and it tries to subvert your expectations and it does that both narratively and with some of the mechanics that it employs um and uh, you know the the world that it creates of this contrasting place of uh, burgeoning city scapes, uh, you know, uh, in the vastness of kind of American, uh, you know, wilderness and uh, plains and mountains and forests and such, I mean, is uh, at times breathtaking. And I have not, it's been a long time since a game created a world uh, that I found myself living in uh, as completely as I feel like I have been living in the world of this game when I play it, you know, and, and, um, it's, I mean, obviously the protagonist is a white man and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a story that sometimes tries to acknowledge racism, but through the, you know, the typical perspective of the, of the white cowboy criminal American anti-hero. And that can be very troubling at times. And yet it's also trying to do things with Arthur that make him not the typical, uh, you know, that the kind of, again, as I said, try to sort of challenge what we expect, uh, from such a, such a figure. Um, I'm, I'm extremely conflicted about it. Uh, the only way that I know how to deal with a situation like this is to finish a game and then take some time to sort out my thoughts and feelings and write about them in some form. So that is my intention. Um, for all of its problems, and they are numerous and they are very real, it is a work that is worth engaging with. Um, I will say that. So... Anyway, so I like I said, I have no other options because it's all I've been doing in my spare time. So I, I can't like it's not so much. This is not like a yay, This is amazing. Freak out or a boo. This is terrible. Freak out. It's a, this is the only thing I've been doing. And I have all kinds of feelings about it. Freak out and stay tuned for more when I actually have some idea what I actually think of this game. I am excited to read your Red Dead Redemption 2 theses that you nailed to the <laughs> church door. When yeah. You finally get it written down. Yeah. All right, you, yes, you can submit your own freak out and it might make it on the show. Just head over to feministfrequency.com slash freak out. That's F-R-E-Q-O-U-T. That is our show. You can catch us back here every single Wednesday. Stay tuned for the bonus episode, which is only available to backers of this podcast, which you can be. Just head over to d.rip slash femfreak. If you're enjoying the show, please rate and review us on iTunes and uh, tell your friends when you're driving them uh, through the Deep South and forcing them to eat (laughs) Kentucky Fried Chicken. You can check out all of our work and our other podcasts at FeministFrequency.com. Uh, so be sure to follow us on Twitter at FemFreak to stay up to date on all the news. You can find our fearless leader, Anita, on Twitter at Anita Sarkeesian. You can find me at Carolyn Michelle. You can find me at Don Shirley's Throne. Oh, man, what a what a throne. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music, technical support by Sarah Norales, production assistance by Taylor Simmons, and art by Jamie Varon. We'll see you next week. Bye!